Hello, hello. How are you? Welcome to our full set review of March of the Machine, The Aftermath. This is a very small set, only 50 new cards. So we're going to do this all in one big video. Um, I just have to say thank you so much for all the love and support on the new unboxing video and first impressions from the Telerian Community College deck box. We've been getting so much love and, and traffic on that video, and it really means a lot to me. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to grow those subscriber numbers so that we get access to more tools on the back end. Um, you know, we're steadily growing, and I'm not uh, upset at our growth at in the slightest. I'm, I'm so fortunate to have met so many great people in this community and keep talking about magic and making magic content. So uh, we're just trying to get access to some more tools and and hopefully make better content in the future. Um, but yeah, but today we're going to look at the entire March of the Machine, the Aftermath. This is like a supplementary set. They're releasing it as if it's a full set. There's some really weird things going on with like booster pack size. Um, but it's basically a post credit scene uh, from the March of the Machine set, which was this huge Avengers Endgame moment. Uh, definitely check out our audio readings of the March of the Machine story. We posted episode one of the Aftermath story today, just now. Um, so check that out if you're interested in the story behind the Aftermath. Otherwise, we're just going to get right in. Um, I'm going to block uh, Tarkin on this beautiful key art here, but uh, nobody cares. Nobody likes Tarkin. It's all about uh, Nissa and Nahiri. That's all anyone cares about. Um, yeah, so we'll go over this whole set. We'll run through all the cards. We'll pick out some some potential spicy cards for, for standard or for limited. And then we'll probably just boot up Arena and play some Explorer because we have an RCQ this weekend and we need to get the reps in. Um, yeah, let's jump right in. So this first, we're starting with white. We're just going to do Wooberg order uh, like normal, but we're not going to take big breaks in between to cut up the... Uh, VOD, we're just gonna go all out. So, 50 cards, let's go. Our first card is a Copper Coat Vanguard. One and speaking of the Vanguard, it's so noisy outside. Uh, Copper Coat Vanguard is one and a white for a 2-2 human soldier. Each other human you control gets plus one, plus oh, and has ward one. This is going to be pretty good in the uh, mono white humans deck. Uh, the standard metagame for the Pro Tour coming up this weekend was released today, and the mono white humans has dropped significantly in the meta. So... I'm interested to see if this helps bring it up a little bit, but it's not uh, not looking good for uh, white weenies right now. Uh, next up, we have Deification. This is a nice little uh, throwback to an older card. Deification is one in a white for an enchantment. As Deification enters the battlefield, choose a Planeswalker type. Planeswalkers you control of the chosen type have Hexproof. As long as you control a creature, if damage dealt to a planeswalker you control of the chosen type would result in all loyalty counters on it being removed. Instead, all but one of those counters are removed. So, as long as you have something to worship your planeswalker, your planeswalker can't be killed. Um, which is a pretty neat little mechanic. Next up, we have Harnessed Snubhorn. <laughs> Harnessed Snubhorn. Three and a white for a 2-5 dinosaur creature with vigilance. Whenever Harnessed Snubhorn deals combat damage to a player, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Straight to the battlefield. That's pretty great. Um... 
That's that's pretty cool. Interesting that they didn't put battle or siege on here. Um, and I don't think they're abandoning it quite yet, but it's interesting that a lot of the creatures had player or battle in the last set, and this set, which is coming right after it, uh, seems to not include that. So we'll we'll keep an eye out for other battle specific cards. Uh, next up, we have a Metropolis Reformer. Two and a white for a 2-3 angel cleric creature with flying and vigilance. You have hexproof. Whenever Metropolis Reformer is dealt damage, you gain that much life. So this is really amazing for those Tron decks. Um, it's also really good against burn. You can't be the target of any spells, so... I think this is going to be at least sideboarded in against red, potentially, if you're playing white. I, this is a great card. This this card is is pretty fantastic. Um, the art on it is even really badass, so it's just all around good card. A 2-3 Flying Vigilance for 3 mana. The, va the value there is just pretty insane. Next up, we have Spark Rupture. 2 and a white for an enchantment. When Spark Rupture enters the battlefield, draw a card. Each player with one or more loyalty counters on it loses all abilities and is a creature with power and toughness equal to the number of loyalty counters on it. So this is kind of a, a theme in the aftermath. A bunch of Planeswalkers have lost their spark due to the war uh, with the Phyrexians. Everyone on this um, piece of art is is included in that we've got tyvar on the far left here we've got obnixilis back here who's lost his spark more times than uh i lose my keys uh we've got narset here kiora and then karn in the background uh basically this just kills planeswalkers turns them into creatures uh it's a pretty cool and unique little play style that comes with this card i think this is fun I don't know if it's going to be fantastic, but, uh, you know, it doesn't, I'd rather get rid of a planeswalker than turn it into a creature that can then attack me. Um, but it's interesting. And then lastly, for white, we've got Tazri Stalwart Survivor. Two and a white for a 3-3 three, three human warrior legendary creature. The art, they got like a rainbow coming out of their armor. Like a spotlight. Each creature you control has tap to add one mana of any of this creature's color. Spend this mana only to activate an ability of a creature. Activate activate only if this creature has another activated ability. Interesting. And then you can pay Wooberg, tap it to mill five cards, put all creature cards with activated abilities that aren't mana abilities from among them, uh, from among the milled cards into your hand. So it's interesting, this is like, it's definitely a commander card. This isn't going to be seen in in standard or constructed formats like at all. Um, there's just too much to kind of balance and, and too many T's to cross and I's to dot. Uh, but it's fun. It's a fun little design. Uh, white has six cards in it, which is interesting because some only have four. Some colors only have like four cards. Some have five. Uh, some don't have legendaries, some do. It's, uh, I'd be intrigued to see how they balanced out the building of this set. Next up we have, we go on to blue, a filter out. This is a fun looking card. For one blue blue, you get an instant that reads, return all non-creature, non-land permanents to their owner's hand. So any of those tokens you've made it really helps clear out if someone's incubating a lot this weekend we'll see firsthand whether or not uh, incubation plays a major role in the current competitive meta um, but this card would wipe out all of that stuff so it's really interesting i think this is going to be a good sideboard card for sure next up we have talarian contempt three blue blue for an enchantment when talarian Con contempt enters the battlefield put a rejection counter on each creature your opponent controls at the beginning of your end step for each opponent choose up to one target creature they control with a rejection counter on it that creature's owner puts it on the top or the bottom of their library 
So this is interesting. It's really slow going. Um, it reminds me of uh, hit counters and hunt counters where you're kind of putting or even slime counters from recent sets. Um, you know, it doesn't you can only choose one per turn. So when you everything your opponent plays is going to have a rejection counter on it. Um, or everything your opponent has played when you play this gets a rejection counter. Um, but you can only choose one to bounce every turn. It's it's really slow going. I don't. I think this is more again of a commander style card. It's way too slow and doesn't do enough in constructed formats to be playable. You might play this in Mono Blue Devotion, maybe, but um, it's still way too slow. It's an interesting car. I like it. Next up, we have Training Grounds. This is interesting. One blue mana for an enchantment. Activated abilities of creatures you control cost two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana in the cost to less than one mana. So if you have a five activation uh, creature, you pay two instead or pay three instead you get two a two mana discount and it's just a one mana enchantment if you're looking to trigger uh permanents entering the battlefield or enchantments entering the battlefield this is a nice cheap way to do that um yeah i think this is gonna find some space in constructed i don't know what just yet it can't reduce it to less than one so there's a lot of really good two activated abilities um, I would say that like this would go hand in hand with any deck that runs a bank buster, but the bank buster activated ability is only two. So you're only getting a one discount, uh, for one mana. So it doesn't really work out. Interested to see where this card goes. Uh, next up we have Vesuvian Drifter. I love this art so much. Uh, two and a blue for a two, four shapeshifter creature with flying. You may look at the top card of your library anytime. At the beginning of each combat, if you reveal the top card of your you may reveal the top card of your library. If you reveal a creature card this way, Vesuvian Drifter becomes a copy of that card until end of turn, except it has flying. So this is really fun to get uh, unique combat triggers in. I think Vesuvian Drifter is going to easily slot into like my errata deck. Um but it's, it's just not one of those things that I can see playing really heavily into Constructed. Which is kind of a bummer because I think, you know, Filter Out is probably the only blue card here that... Um, hold on, let me just... I want to see the cards before I'm pre-clicking on them. So I know what, where we're going with different colors. Um... I think filter out is probably like the only card that is almost guaranteed to be in a constructed card. This is going to be registered at tournaments 100%. Um, the other blue stuff, maybe training grounds, find some space. Uh, maybe Vesuvian Drifter finds it if you're looking for very particular attack or combat damage triggers. Otherwise, I don't see much hype around blue in this tiny set. We'll move on to black. First up, we have Yara's Oath Sworn. Look at this horse with the jagged unicorn horn-like stuff coming out of its face. Jesus. Uh, one and a black for a 2-2 human knight. Good value right off the bat with Menace. Even better. I'm liking it. Whenever a Yara's Oathsworn deals combat damage to a player, if it has fewer than four 1-1 counters on it, put a 1-1 counter on it. Then, if it has exactly four, search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle? What? So this is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with Menace, so it's almost always going to get through on turn 3. Most people... 
either A, don't have two bodies on board to block a Menace creature on turn three, or two, don't want to give up their creatures on turn three yet. And then if you connect four times, it turns into a, a tutor. And you don't have to take the four counters off of it. So it just is a 6-6. Six, six. That's really interesting. I think that's kind of spicy. Uh, next up, we have Blot Out, which is my votes for like some of the best art on any Magic the Gathering card ever. Uh, Blot Out is a two and a black for an instant. Target opponent exiles a creature or planeswalker they control with the greatest mana value among creatures and planeswalkers they control. So this is just like strictly better Shieldred's Edict. Um, Edict was one and a black for your opponent choosing to destroy either a creature, non-token creature, or planeswalker. Um, this is target their best creature or planeswalker. And so I think it's just a little bit better. And again, the art is amazing. Next up, we have Death Rattle Oni. Six and a black for a 5-4 demon spirit with flash. The spell costs two less to cast for each creature that died this turn. Interesting. When Death Rattle Oni enters the battlefield, destroy all other creatures that were dealt damage. Ooh. So this is a you are already dead on a creature, which we've seen a couple times, but the fact that this has flash and costs two less to cast for each creature that died this turn. Say you had a bunch of chump block. If you had a bunch of one ones, you could block all of their best creatures with a bunch of one ones. Play this for like three mana and kill all of the stuff that you dealt damage to this turn. That's pretty. That's pretty spicy. I don't think the stuff, the the kill something that has already been dealt damage. That kind of gameplay loop has not really taken off in constructed formats very much. So I don't expect this to um, change that, but it is kind of fun. And I think that, you know, especially in commander, that's that could be really lethal. Uh, next up, we've got Markov Baron. What is with the huge trucks driving by right now? Markov Baron is two and a black for a two, two vampire noble with convoke so that Convoke means that creatures you creatures you control can tap to add one mana of their color or one colorless mana to help you cast this. Uh, Markov Baron has lifelink and other vampires you control get plus one plus one. So a nice uh, vampire lord, which is really good. And then it has madness two and a black. When you discard this card, discard it into exile. When you do, cast it for its madness cost or put it into your graveyard. So you can discard this and cast it. Um, which which is interesting. It's always good to have like a discard outlet and Markov Baron cards with madness help you cast stuff that you've discarded. So that's, that's always good. Uh, vampires aren't super strong right now, so... I'm curious as to if this is going to find a home in anything. A lot of these designs feel very much commander heavy. And we'll get into that in a little bit too. Once we start talking about some of these de-sparked planeswalkers. Uh, next up we have Urborg Scavengers. Two and a black for a 2-2 two -two creature spirit. Look at these cute little guys. Picking up all the Phyrexian parts. Whenever Urborg Scavengers enters the battlefield or attacks, exile target card from a graveyard. Put a 1-1 counter on Urborg Scavengers. Okay, so it's like Graveyard Trespasser. Um, Urborg Scavengers has flying as long as a card exiled with it has flying. Oh. The same is true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. Are they leaving anything off that list? First strike, double strike, death touch, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, reach, trample, vigilance. I guess not. That's pretty cool. Okay, so it's um, 
It's Graveyard Trespasser, but it soaks up the abilities on cards it exiles. I think that's really cool. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a sinus thing. I'm going to mute for a second. Just one sec. I gotta, I gotta blow my nose. Okay, um, do I see this replacing Graveyard Trespasser? Um, maybe. It's the same mana. The only problem is, is it doesn't ever exile two, and Graveyard Trespasser, if you target creatures, can siphon life from your opponent. I don't... I don't think it straight up replaces Graveyard Trespasser, but there is an argument for sideboarding Graveyard Trespasser out and these guys in if you're playing against a deck with like a Traxa or something in it because these scavengers is going to get all of those Atraxa um, keywords which is really cool and it puts a 1-1 counter on it every time so um, it doesn't have to be a, a creature I think it's almost neck and neck I don't I think the siphon ability on Trespasser makes it a little bit more powerful for stuff like standard, um, mono black, graveyard hate. Um, but I think scavengers, I'm not going to be surprised if some people switch out Trespassers for scavengers. And then we go on to red. Our first red card is Arnie Metal Brow. So um, for those of you that didn't play uh, Caltime, Arnie Broken Brow was this illustrious warrior berserker who had a horn stuck in his head from an epic battle he had with a beast. And now Arnie has a metal brow, so he's been stabbed once again with a second horn. This time it's a Phyrexian horn, so he's got a metal brow. Um, Arnie is a 3-3 human berserker legendary creature. Whenever a creature you control attacks or a creature enters the battlefield under your control attacking, you may pay two, one and a red. If you do, you may put a creature card with mana value less than that creature's mana value from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. So that's pretty cool. Um, it doesn't say you can only do this once per turn. So there is an opportunity there to... Um, Attack with Arnie, pay two, put something less than three mana onto the battlefield, pay two again, put something that's one mana onto the battlefield, or you can start higher. If you have something that's six mana value, CMC, you attack with that, then you play a five, you pay two, you play, you play a four, you pay two, and it's just this really kind of snowball-y attack effect. I really like that. Uh, Coligan's Warmonger. Coligan Warmonger. Two and a red for a 3-2 Ogre Warrior with haste. Whenever Coligan Warmonger attacks, look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a dragon card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This is really good for those dragon decks. Um, there's not anything in Constructed right now that yells dragon, but again... A lot of these cards are kind of commander skewed so this would be amazing if you play commander and you play dragon decks um, i would suggest picking up a copy of coligan warmonger pretty good card next up we have plarg and nasari some in um i almost said innistrad some strixhaven teachers some deans uh, three red red for a 5-4 Orc Ifrit legendary creature. So it's another team up. 
At the beginning of your upkeep, each player exiles the top card of their library until they exile a non-land card. Each opponent chooses a non-land card exiled this way. You may cast up to two spells from among other cards exiled this way without paying their mana costs. So you basically get the worst card that all of your opponents exile. Obviously, this being a commander leaning card, you're going to have three piles to choose from. Um, it does say each player, so you get access to your own deck, as your own library as well. Um, so you'll have four cards to choose from in total. You can pick your highest value card, um, but all your opponents are going to pick the worst card that they exile, so keep that in mind, but it's still pretty cool. There's a lot of cards that care about casting stuff from exile as well, so this is a nice combo piece for that. Uh, Reckless Handling. One in a red for a sorcery. Search your library for an artifact card, reveal it, put it into your hand, shuffle, then discard a card at random. If an artifact card was discarded this way, Reckless Handling deals two damage to each opponent. So, I mean... The Boros equipment deck just continues to get more spicy picks, and this is no different. Um, the deck is completely irrelevant in standard right now, but there's a lot of really great um, commander decks that, that love this stuff, so good for them, I guess. I like it. It's fun. Moving on to green... We have Animist's Might up first, two and a green for a sorcery. This spell costs two less to cast if it targets a legendary creature you control. Target creature you control deals damage equal to twice its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. Interesting, so it's a bite spell but doubles the power. And if you target a legendary, it only costs one green mana, which is really cool. I think most fight spells cost one or two. Um... This costs three if you're targeting something that's not legendary and only one if you're targeting something that is. I think this, the only downside is that it's a sorcery speed uh, bite spell, which, um, you know, isn't great, but uh, isn't terrible either. I think this could slot into some, um, some green decks in Constructed. It's def definitely not uh, standard. I think green is just really, really weak in standard right now, unless you're playing some version of Jund. And even then, like, those decks aren't doing very well against the heavy hitters like uh, Grixis and Rakdos mid-range. Next up, we have Leyline Immersion. Three in the green for an enchantment aura. Enchant Legendary Creature. Enchanted legendary enchanted creature has ward two and tap to add five mana in any color combination. Spend this mana only to cast spells. So you can't use the five mana to activate other abilities. That's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, the enchantment decks are definitely going to have a field day with this, but uh, it's a little expensive and a little over the top to... Uh, Actually, this could play well in some of those Atraxa decks. This might be the biggest hit so far for standard. Add five mana in any combination of colors. Yeah, that's pretty good. Especially because there's so many good one and two drop legendary creatures that you can cast this on turn four and immediately tap a legendary you control for five mana. That's really good. Uh, next up, we have Nissa Resurgent Animist, obviously the target for the previous spell we looked at. Um, it, Nissa is a two and a green for a three, three elf scout legendary creature. Nissa Ravain has lost her spark. She is no longer a planeswalker, um, which becomes. Uh, a brutal joke when you read her ability because it's landfall so she's fallen uh, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control add one mana of any color that's really good 
instant ramp. Uh, then, if this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal an elf or elemental card. Put that card into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So you'll notice the background of this card has the little Planeswalker de-sparked logo. Um, there's just like huge trucks outside. I don't know why. Um, so this was rumored really early. The wizards for some reason revealed a bunch of accessories and... It's like shaking the whole apartment. Um, they revealed a bunch of play mats and, and key art, not key art, um, advertisement art for the aftermath and this symbol was plastered on a bunch of characters and it was rumored that it meant that they had lost their spark and then they released a t-shirt on their website a month ago that called this symbol d spark and everyone was like oh okay try not to hide it or anything wizards spoil your own stuff uh i think this card is cool I think uh, the landfall trigger is awesome. You play this on three and then, or you play this on four, immediately play a new a new land right afterwards. You get two more mana. I think that's not bad. Or even play this on three and just kind of wait. Turn four, you have five mana. Turn six, you have seven. Um, if you can get double triggers then you get to reveal from the top of your deck until you find an elf or elemental i think that's fun definitely more of a commander card and i think that that's one of the bigger not concerns but critiques that people have with the aftermath so far is that um wizards of the coast has been designing these really prolific planeswalkers for so long these characters that we know and love um, but none of them have legendary creature cards, so they can't be commanders unless you play um, Oathbreaker or your, you've got one of the rare legendary creature or legendary planeswalkers that says it can be your commander. Um, so the critique is, is that Magic and Wizards uh, de-sparked a bunch of their famous planeswalkers so that they can be commander leaders commanders um and i don't think that's the right choice personally for like developing a story um i don't mind that they were de-sparked i think planeswalkers losing their ability to planeswalk is a really interesting twist to you know a multiverse of really powerful beings and some of them have the ability to traverse the multiverse um so i think Planeswalkers losing their spark is fine if the reason that they chose to do this is so that they can put famous characters on the front of commander decks um, then I don't really love that but the end result is all the same so it doesn't really matter next up we have open the way this is X green green for a sorcery X can't be greater than the number of players in the game so X can only be four at max. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal X land cards. So four at max. Put those lands onto the battlefield tapped and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it's like, um, it's a, just a big ramp spell. Um, it's interesting. I wonder the order of the triggers with the Nissa Resurgent Animist and this. Do all of the lands enter the battlefield at the same time, or do they enter one at a time? Because if they enter one at a time, then the second one is going to trigger Nyssa. And then you have to pause. They must all enter at the same time, just for clarity. It's a, it's a decent ramp spell, but, uh, you know, to get the most out of it, you're... You know, you're paying six mana to ramp up to ten mana if you play this on turn six. Which is, isn't that bad, but, uh, you know, sometimes that'll make or, make or break the game. 
I honestly think six is the best turn area to play a, a spell like this. So I think this is pretty good commander card. Next up, we have Tranquil Frillback. Two and a green for a 3-3 three, three dinosaur creature. When, when Tranquil Frillback enters the battlefield, you may pay green up to three times. When you pay this cost one or more times, choose up to that many. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Exile target player's graveyard or gain four life. So you can pay six total and do all three of those. Plus you have a 3-3. Three, three. I mean, that's just a good card, right? I think this is going to make it into um, standard. I think this is going to, to be a good sideboard card. That people are always looking for inventive ways to, you know, have graveyard hate to control artifacts and enchantments on your opponent's board also you get the life gain if you really want i think this is uh pretty solid pretty solid and that last for green we have undercity upheaval this is really beautiful uh one green green for a sorcery with undergrowth distribute x11 one, one counters among any number of target creatures you control where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard as you cast this spell. Creatures you control gain vigilance until end of turn. That's pretty cool. That's, that's decent. This art is astounding though. That's beautiful. All right, let's jump into multicolors. So these are our gold cards for March of the Machine Aftermath. First up, we have Calyx, Guided by Fate. Uh, another de-sparked planeswalker. Calyx is one green white for a legendary enchantment creature, Human Druid. He's a 2-2 with Constellation. Whenever Calyx, guided by fate or another enchantment, enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1-1 counter on target creature. It doesn't have to be Calyx. Amazing card already. Then there's more. Whenever Calyx or an enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may create a token that's a copy of non-legendary enchantment you control. Do this only once each turn. So Calyx buffs other creatures and duplicates your enchantments for three mana. This card is insane. This card is amazing. Um, I even think a card like this with a little bit of risk and reward play could revitalize the Selesnya enchantments deck in standard. Um, but again, you're looking at like a small portion of the meta growing to a little bit bigger, but still a small portion of the meta. This card is fantastic. If you play enchantments in, um, commander this card is a must play next up we have campus renovation the strixhaven uh lore hold campus three red white for a sorcery return up to one target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield exile the top two cards of your library you may until the end of your next turn you may play those cards that's not bad bring something back Take a look at the top two cards of your library. I'd take that deal. Uh, next up, we have Cosmic Rebirth, another Selesnya card. One green white for an instant. Choose target permanent card in your graveyard. If it has mana value three or less, you may put it onto the battlefield. If you don't put it onto the battlefield, put it into your hand and you gain three life. Now, Calyx is three mana, so... You play Calyx, they obviously see it as a threat, they kill it, you play Cosmic Rebirth, you bring it right back to the battlefield. And you gain three life. That's that's ridiculous. Next up we have another Selesnya card. Danatha, new Benalia's Light. So Danatha has taken up um, the role of her dad uh, now that he is Phyrexian Dust. Uh, Danatha New Benalia's Light is one green white for a 2 2 human knight legendary creature with vigilance, trample, and lifelink. Once during each of your turns, you may cast an aura or equipment spell from your graveyard. Dang. Okay. That's fun. 
Next up, we have Beast of the Victorious Dead. One white, one black for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, if one or more creatures died this turn, you gain that much life and distribute that many 1-1 one -one counters among creatures you control. Sheesh. If one or more creatures died this... Not even your creatures. You gain that much life and distribute that many 1-1. One -one. So if four creatures died, you gain four life and put four 1-1 one -one counters on things? That's so good. That's like really good. Dang. Uh, next up, we have Gold Forged Thopterex. Thopterex? One, one white, one blue for a 1 3 dinosaur Thopter artifact creature with flying and lifelink. Each legendary permanent you control has Ward 2. That's interesting. I wonder if there's any consideration to put this in Esper Legends. Interesting. Esper Legends, by the way, has like not gained as much love. It's lost a little bit of love in this last meta shift, uh, thanks to a few new burn and targeted spells from March of the Machine, the full set. Um, so that was interesting. I was unexpected to see Esper Legends drop down the meta rather than go up the meta. Next up, we have Jarena Dauntless General. One white, one black for a 2-2 human soldier legendary creature. When Jarena Dauntless General enters the battlefield, exile target player's graveyard. That's pretty good. Sacrifice Jarena. Humans you control gain hexproof and indestructible until the end of turn. I mean, that's really good, too. This could easily go into Esper Legends. It's got graveyard hate on it, and you can protect humans you control, which is like, what, half of the Esper Legends deck? Uh, next up, we have Joel Riel, Voice of Salfir. This is stunning. I love this. Two... Uh, green blue for a legendary creature human druid 3-3 three, three. at the beginning of combat on your turn you may up to one target land you control becomes an xx green and blue bird creature with flying and haste until end of turn where x is the number of cards in your hand it is still a land whenever a land creature you control deals combat damage to a player draw a card that's really cool I love that last part because, um, you know, you pair this with the Ren and Realmbreaker Planeswalker or the original um, Tatiova or the even the new Tatiova makes land creatures flying. Um, you know, you get a lot of land. I think there's a cool land deck to be built. I'm going to build it. Kenrith's Funeral, two white. Uh, sorry, the Kenrith's Royal Funeral. R.I.P. Kenrith. I'm doing that way too many times. Um, two white to black for a legendary enchantment. When the Kenrith Royal Funeral enters the battlefield, exile up to two target legendary creatures you control. Or, sorry, two legendary creatures from your graveyard. You draw X cards, lose X life, where X is the greatest mana value among the cards exiled this way. Legendary spells you cast cause one less to cast for each card exiled with the Kenris Royal Funeral. Interesting. Um, I've got a handful of cards left to go, and I really need to take a bio break, so I will be right back.
Hello. I should have turned up the music. I'm sorry. All right, let's move on. All right, next up we have Kiora, Sovereign of the Deep. Kiora is another infamous planeswalker that has lost their spark. Uh, you can tell again by the D Spark logo behind the flavor text or the card text. Kiora, Sovereign of the Deep, is three green blue for a four five legendary creature, Merfolk Noble, at Mythic Rare, with Vigilance and Ward three. Whenever you cast a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent spell from your hand, look at the top X cards of your library, where X is that spell's mana value. You may cast a spell with mana value less than X from among them without paying its mana cost. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. I mean, that's big. The only problem is, is that as soon as I saw this card, I realized it cannot go into my Runo, the Stor Runo Stormkirk deck. Which is all about playing Krakens, Leviathans, Octopus, and Serpents. Um, so that's a bit of a bummer, but cool card. I love Kiora. I have a bunch of Kiora uh, Planeswalker cards. For some reason, it was just something I got early in my collection, and I've just been collecting all the Kiora cards that I can. Um, yeah, and this one's really cool. I'm sad that she got desparked, but. Uh, couldn't have happened to a, a better merfolk, to be honest. Next up, we have Nahiri Forged in Fury, another uh, famous planeswalker that has now lost their spark. Nahiri Forged in Fury is four red white for a 5 4 legendary creature core artificer. They have an affinity for equipment, so it costs one less to cast for each equipment you control. Whenever an equipped creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. You may cast equipment spells this way without paying their mana costs. So this is going to be really interesting for the, you know, Colossal Hammer decks. Um, being able to cast that for free is really good. Really, really good. I think this is cool. Also, I'm sad that Kiora didn't keep her knife arms. Or sorry, Nahiri didn't keep her knife arms. Um, but she does still have the like Phyrexian rune scarring on her neck and face, which is really cool. And this has got to be the most like badass growl on any magic art. Uh, next up, we have Nahiri's Resolve. Three red, white for an enchantment. Creature cr creatures you control have plus one and plus zero and have haste. At the beginning of your end step, exile any number of non-token artifacts and or creatures you control. Return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control at the beginning of your next end upkeep. Sorry. So you can hit something. You can attack with something that you care about. Or better yet, attack with an equipment that you care about that's very dangerous. At your end step, you exile that piece of equipment so that nobody can destroy it. And then when you start your next turn, it comes back and you can re-equip it. That's pretty fun. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, next up, we have one of the most exciting cards to me. Uh, I love Narset so much. I play a lot of control in older formats and Narset is the, the queen of control decks uh, this new Narset after she has lost her spark is Narset Enlightened Exile for one blue red white so one and a Jexai Jeskai sorry you get a 3-4 legendary creature human monk creatures you control have prowess whenever Narset Enlightened Exile attacks Exile target non-creature, non-land card with mana value less than Narset's power from a graveyard and copy it. You may cast the copy for free. That's pretty cool. And then because all of your creatures have prowess, when you cast that next copy, um, everything gets bigger. So I think this is really, really fun. Cool for a Spellslinger deck. Um, I really like it.
I'm going to build this deck for sure in Commander. I don't think it has a home. I want it to have a home in modern... Um, sorry, not modern, but like current standard. Uh, but I don't think it will. I have to take a look at the uh, more recent uh, Jeskai control lists. There's a few in the meta for this weekend's pro tour so we'll take a look it might slot in nicely it might not uh, next up we have the boy nashi moon's legacy you can see ghostly um oh my god i forgot their name uh what is their name Cameo. Oh my, I can't believe I just my whole brain just stopped working. Um, so Nashi is, if you don't know the story, Nashi is Tamio's adopted son. Um, in the Kami, latest Kamigawa set, he was Nashi Moon Sage's Scion. Um, now that Tamio is dead and her ghost is looking after him, uh, Nashi becomes Moon's legacy. For one black, one green, one blue, you get a 3-4 legendary creature Rat Shaman with Menace and Ward 1. Whenever Nashi attacks, exile up to one target legendary or rat card from your graveyard and copy it, you may cast the copy. So he makes copies of Dead Things, which R.I.P. his mom. Um, it's kind of fitting. Not a fantastic card, but it's it seems fun to kind of build around, I think. I think it's pretty fun. Um, next up, we have Niv-Mizzet Supreme. Niv-Mizzet is back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it Niv-Mizzet Supreme costs one Wooburg, so a white, blue, black, red, and green for a 5-5 legendary creature dragon avatar with flying and hexproof from monocolored. Each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard that's exactly two colors has jumpstart. And jumpstart means you may cast that card from your graveyard by discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs. Then you exile the card that you just cast from your graveyard. So niv is back. Um, I think it's definitely like a commander card. I don't think this is playing in even the domain control decks where we're seeing all five colors um niv mizzet has been and always will be a actually scratch that niv mizzet will be a commander card there's previous versions of niv mizzet that were very popular and standard uh, next up we have another d sparked planeswalker obnixilis captive kingpin two black red for a four three legendary creature demon with flying and trample Whenever one or more opponents each lose exactly one life, put a 1-1 counter on Obnixilis. Then you may exile the top card of your library. Until your next end step, you may play that card. So you get card access uh, and 1-1 counters. Um, if you can collectively or consistently deal one damage to your opponents. Next up, we have Pia Nalar, Consul of Revival. So Pia has been promoted to Consul of Revival. Pia is one red, one white for a 2-3 legendary creature human artificer. Thopters you control have haste. Whenever you play a land from exile or cast a spell from exile, create a 1-1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. Um, another great commander card if you're playing artifacts or thopters um red white for thopters is a little weird but um you know it's interesting if you if you can manage to play like a three color artifacts deck uh this is pretty good inclusion next up we have rebuild the city three black red green for a sorcery choose target land create three tokens that are copies of it except their three three creatures in addition to their other types and they have vigilance and menace so this gives you uh three three threes for six mana um 
it's it's interesting i think it's cool especially if you're playing that um if you can manage to play that kiora card no not kiora um that Jor joel riel card is pretty cool where you get to draw cards uh when your lands deal damage it's okay it's it's interesting this new capanna rebuild mode is kind of cool in the uh imagery i'm not excited about it but it seems fine next up we have rocco street chef out of all the new capanna characters to bring back um for some reason they chose rocco Rocco Street Chef is a red, green, white for a 2-4 legendary creature elf druid. At the beginning of your end step, each player exiles the top card of their library. Until your next end step, each player may play the card exiled this way. Whenever a player plays a land card from exile or casts a spell from exile, you may put a 1-1 counter on target creature and create a food token. So this is kind of like a group hug design where you're offering your opponents the opportunity to play cards off the top of their library and get access to more of their library but every time they do take advantage of that you get the one one counters and the food tokens uh, next up we have samut vizier of nakt Nactaman, Vizier of Nactaman. Um, Samut w has lost their spark as well, which is unfortunate, but this is a really cool pose, so you win some, you lose some. Uh, one red green for a 2 3 legendary creature, human warrior cleric, with first strike, vigilance, and haste. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, if that creature entered the battlefield this turn, draw a card. Very cool. Next up, we have Sarkin, Soul of Flame. Sarkin has also lost their spark. Uh, less of a cool pose, but uh, again, win some, lose some. Sarkin is one blue red for a 2 4 legendary creature, Human Shaman. Dragon spells you cast cost one less to cast. Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, you may have Sarkin become a copy of it until end of turn except its name is Sarkin and it's legendary in addition to its other types. That's pretty cool. Sarkin becomes dragons. I like it. Uh, next up, we have Sagarda Font of Blessings. Two green white for a 4-4 legendary creature angel with flying. Other permanents you control have hexproof. That's huge. For four mana, protect all of your other permanents. Uh, you may look at the top card of your library at any time, and you may cast angels and human spells from the top of your library. That's big. Selesnia Angels is very powerful, um, and this makes it even better. Next up, we have Tyvar the Bellicose, another planeswalker who has lost their spark, but obviously hasn't lost their riz. Uh, two black green for a 5-4 legendary creature elf warrior. A 5-4 five, four, for 4. That's pretty good. When one or more elves you control attack, they gain death touch until end of turn. That is crazy. Each creature you control has whenever a mana ability of this creature is resolved. Put a number of 1-1 one, one counters on it equal to the amount of mana this creature produced. This ability triggers only once each turn. So this is... It's just like... Tyvar turns your mana dorks into lethal attackers. Um, and it also buffs your mana dorks if they tap for mana. That's pretty great. Uh, next up is the last of the desparked planeswalkers, Karn Legacy Reforged. For five colorless, you get a star star legendary artifact creature, Golem. Karn, legacy, reforged, power, and toughness are equal to the greatest mana value among artifacts you control. At the beginning of your upkeep, add colorless for each artifact you control. This mana can't be spent to cast non-artifact spells. 
Until end of turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. So this helps you cast artifacts and has power and toughness equal to your most expensive artifact. That's a pretty damn good card. Um, Karn is always a good boy and this boy is real good. So definitely keep an eye out for this if you're kind of constructing that Artifact Matters deck. Um, almost all of these legendary creatures are for Commander and designed for Commander. So don't be upset if these don't fit into your constructed decks. Um, Karn Legacy Reforged is going to be a fun addition to a lot of Artifact Matters Commander decks. And finally... The last card in Aftermath, we have Dranith Ruins, a land card. Tap to add colorless. Pay two, tap, put two 1-1 one, one counters on target non-human creature that entered the battlefield this turn. So it buffs creatures or taps for colorless. And, and that's it. That is the whole set for March of the Machine Aftermath. I honestly think, other than some of these... Um, powerful legendary creatures that are obviously kind of geared towards um, commander I think Narset is one of those ones that might be able to slot into a standard deck especially because uh, Jeskai control is kind of rising in the ranks a bit um, but I honestly think that uh Where, where did it go? This, I think that Leyline Immersion is probably the, the biggest impact card in this whole set. Um, I would give a special shout out to Metropolis Reformer because this card is going to be very good. I don't know that it has a necessary home. It might just be a great sideboard card against burn decks. I think that Filter Out is a fantastic bounce spell for all non-creature, non-land permanents. Um, what else is there? I think the Scavengers is a really interesting card and has argument to replace Graveyard Trespasser in a lot of circumstances. It continuously gets bigger, uh, and I think that that's great. I think... Um, Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. I think that there's a couple interesting pieces for the Esper Legends deck. And I think there's a couple decent pieces for the Selesnia Enchantments deck. And other than that, I just think Leyline Immersion is probably uh, the most potent card in this set. Definitely keep an eye out for it. Um, especially against those domain decks. I think this is going to be a really big deal, giving an enchanted creature Ward 2. Um, and the ability to tap for 5 mana is is pretty crazy. It, it might be too top in. Like, Mark, don't take my word for gospel. I think this is very close to that line where it's too slow. It ramps you awkwardly from, like, four mana to um, nine mana so unless there's something in that range that you really want to play flat out without cheating it out onto the battlefield um, it might not be as potent as I'm thinking it will be uh, but I do, uh, after reading all of these cards and going through this whole set I think Lane Line Immersion has the most potential I think there's a couple arguments to be made for um some some bounce and control -y spells but other than that I think that that is my sleeper and, and if can you even call it a sleeper hit if the whole set is only 50, 50 cards um, I don't think you can um, anyways thank you so much for hanging out and going over March of the Machine, the Aftermath with me. This is the entire set review, 50 cards coming out uh, on May 12th. Don't forget to watch the Pro Tour this weekend on Twitch. 
It is going to be Pro Tour March of the Machine. It's going to be very exciting. Three days of awesome magic to be had starting tomorrow, Friday the 5th. Um, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're putting out some really fun content, some content I'm really enjoying making, and it would mean a lot to us if you could uh, subscribe to the channel. If you want to get notified when we post new things, definitely hit that like, little bell button next to uh, the subscribe to turn on notifications. Also, just like the videos and post comments. Let me know. I want to, I always want to talk magic with people. So I'm never going to scoff or turn aside a comment with a question or a remark regarding magic. Um, and thank you so much for, for continuing to watch these and, and be a part of our amazing community. This, this um, game has brought me close to so many amazing people uh, over the course of the last like six months or so. So I can't thank you all enough for for being here and saying hello and sharing your adoration for this game we like. Um, yeah, I hope all of your opening hands are keeps and I hope all of your opponents mulligan. Thank you again so much. I will talk to you.